So, yeah, welcome to today's lecture within our course, Machine Learning. We are still in round one, which is on the three components of machine learning, data model and loss. So in the last week's lecture, we walked through all the three components, starting with data, data points, their features and labels. Then we discussed models, which are sets of hypotheses. And the hypothesis is understood in this course mainly as a function or a map that takes the features and outputs a prediction for the label, the quantity of interest. The third component is a loss function, which is used to measure how good is a particular hypothesis. So there's already one question, can the features be the data points itself? Yeah, you can use, you can use data points themselves as features. So in, in unsupervised, uh, they are called unsupervised learning methods. We use the, the raw features of a data point also as label. Uh, and we want to learn a simple hypothesis, for example, only a linear function, which is able to predict the original features as the label. And we will talk about this, such methods in round six of the course, later in the course. Okay, just looking. Yeah, uh, is Yuka here? I invited a lecturer of a related course, Yuka Kohonen. Can you please make yourself noticed? No, I think he's not here yet. Okay. So, uh, yeah, first I would like to remind you. Uh, of the next uh, deadlines. So in this week, you have to review uh, the, the student projects that have been proposed by your colleagues. So you have to peer grade and peer review the other students. And I have seen that some students are already active on this. So it seems to be not too difficult. Are there any questions at this point regarding this peer grading? So I have to double check again the deadline. There's now one comment that uh, peer grade, uh, the peer grading is open till 24th. Yeah, I need to check again. I will, I will inform you about the correct deadline. It should be end of this week, but I'm not sure yet if it's Friday or Sunday. Uh, might be a good idea to finish this task by Friday, but uh, I will double check again the deadline. Uh, the peer grading is not anonymous. Uh, is that intentional? Uh, yes, so this is a test run. So this is a, a kind of a, a test run for the peer grading that we then use also for the bigger student projects, for the, uh, for the student projects, which can be different from uh, the topic that you now choose. Yeah, and depending on our experiences here, we, we might make this then anonymous, this peer grading. In principle, it should not matter too much if it's anonymous or not, because you have to obey the, the kind of the, the ground rules, which is the code of conduct at Alto, uh, which asks you to be uh, kind of uh, respectful and always honest. And so there should be not a problem if it's if the identity of the reviewer is known. But we might make it anonymous if we find it's more suitable for the for the bigger student project then. Uh, <clears throat> then another question, where can we find the peer grading? Uh, yes, you can find it under section, uh, my courses page, section assignments. And then you must click on my, uh, or your machine learning problem activity. Okay, so uh, just go through one example, 
uh, which I have received by some student and which allows me to, to use his uh, specification of a machine learning problem to illustrate how the peer grading could could work or I expect the peer grading how, how it should work. Uh, yeah, well, there's one question here in the meanwhile, when is the deadline for quiz one? I guess this deadline for quiz one is actually Friday uh, evening. So by Friday midnight, you have to submit your answers to quiz one. But I'm not sure now if, if the <clears throat> the deadline for the peer review is uh, is later on a Sunday. So somebody raise the hand, please uh, ask the question on the chat then. Okay, so I now read through the this example uh, of a machine learning problem uh, by Julian Gründahl. So considering how expensive college is in the United States compared to the rest of the world, I was interested in learning which American schools, regions, and majors yield the highest earn after graduation. So in this problem, the data points are American college programs. The features of the data points are the school itself, uh, the region, or the location of the school, the type of college, liberal arts, party, engineering, state school, etc., and the degree, if it's a major. And the label or quantity of interest here is the graduates starting and mid-career salaries. So we actually have two quantities of interest. One quantity of interest is the expected starting salary and another quantity of interest is the mid-career salary. So this uh, machine learning, uh, this formulation uh, clearly indicates what the data points are. So the data points are American college programs. One data point represents one particular college program. Like one data point could be also, if we, if we look also at European programs, one data point could be the Bachelor of Data Science at Alto University, could be a program. And the quantity of interest are the starting and the mid-career salaries. So the label is specified, also fine. Uh, the features are also specified. So features are the properties of a data point that we can measure easily or download somewhere. And then the student also points out or speculates uh, about the sources of labeled data points. So uh, data points here are school, uh, uh, college programs and labeled data points would be college programs for which we know what the, the starting and mid-career salaries of the graduates are on average. So he speculates that this can be found on, a Kaggle, uh, on the Kaggle platform. So all, all aspects satisfied, so I would uh, uh, give this uh, machine learning formulation all points. I would uh, tick all the boxes in the review. So here's one question. The data points should be schools. Uh, I guess not the program, am I right? Yeah, it depends. So uh, here, as this is formulated, the one data point is a, is a program. So there can be several different programs at the same college, but these all these different programs make make different uh, data points. But you could also, you could look at the different machine learning problem where you say one data point is a whole college. Yes, so here's one uh, excellent student comment. That's a design choice. As I said, what you consider as a data point is a design choice. And here, the design choice is that one data point is one college program. But you could also look at another machine learning problem where one data point is a whole college. So you want to know if I go to Alto, how much will I earn? Or if I go to MIT, how much will I earn? But here it's, it's a fine, fine, fine grained uh, version of, the, of this, uh, where we look at individual programs. Uh, yes. And there's another question. For type of college, shouldn't the feature data type be more specific yeah, again, uh, like what you consider as data points, also what you consider as features of a data points is a design choice. 
And uh, the only way to find out, or maybe the only way to find out if this set of features proposed by Julian here is, is good, is to try to learn a predictor for this for the salaries. So to try to apply a machine learning method to solve this machine learning problem. And this is exactly what you should do in your student project. And I don't expect you to, to uh, be kind of a top ranked in some competition. So it's not about reaching 99% accuracy. It's not at all about that. So the student project is about uh, documenting uh, providing a document of your journey, of your machine learning journey during the project, all the way starting from formulating the machine learning problem by specifying data points, features, labels, and also choosing data sources, all the way from this specification down to evaluating the results when you applied uh, a linear regression or a deep neural network, whatever you want. Okay. Uh, another comment, would it make sense to use individual students as data points and the programs they choose as features? The salary would be a feature then. Yes, you could also look at this. Yeah, it's up to you. It's a design choice. Okay, let's now, uh, yeah, I would like to go quickly over some of the questions that have been collected from uh, the teaching assistants in the exercise sessions. Uh, yeah, by the way, today, at, after this lecture, starting at 16.15, there is again an exercise session. So the next exercise session is uh, at uh, quarter past four. Please stop by and ask questions there. So one question was, if I'm interested in image or natural language processing for my project, how can I approach it without coding? Yeah, this is up to you. So uh, you must make yourself uh, uh, aware of uh, available uh, software that allows you to do machine learning by some graphical user interface. So I have put here a link uh, from Two Words Data Science uh, about some high level uh, software or frameworks where you just drag and drop the, the data. And so you choose that you specify the data file, you specify the model that you want to try, uh, linear regression or a, deep neural network, you specify the loss function, and then you hit the, the run button. There are such frameworks, and uh, it's up to you to choose the project at the level that you can handle, given your coding abilities. So we, we try to give you some start kickstart for using Python, but uh, as I promised, uh, we do not require you to be uh, uh, familiar with Python to pass this course with, with top grade. So that's my promise and you can always rely on that promise. But uh, if you want to do uh, develop an um, uh, image classifier, it might be more convenient to have some Python knowledge to, to start from an existing uh, Python code or they are called Python notebooks and adapt it according to your own uh, project. Yeah. Uh, then there's one question. I have solved some of the book exercises. How could I have them checked? Is it possible to get some point by sharing them with you? Uh, yes, so I grant bonus points for uh, uh, submitting reference solutions to the, to the uh, exercises I have sketched in the, in the course book or in the lecture notes. Please uh, send your solutions by email to me. Yeah, there's a, a good comment. A, a well-documented and spectacular failure can give a lot better learning experience and better grading than a run of the mill accurate model. Yes, exactly. So uh, one of the key uh, lessons in this course is that learning happens only from failure. Only if you make an error, you learn. And uh, it's about uh, how you learn from your experiences. Also in the student project. You do not have to achieve a certain benchmark regarding the, the accuracy of your model. Not at all. Okay. Uh, do we have any other? So what was another question? Um, yeah, the indicator functions. 
So this is related. There, there was one question, uh, there's one quiz question that, uh, yeah, uh, so one student asked, is there an exercise session later this week? Yes, so please check the, the My Courses page section, uh, lectures and exercises, which indicates the, the, day, uh, the, the days and the weekdays and times of the exercise sessions. We have six parallel exercise sessions during which any of which you can stop by and ask questions. So the next one is today. And then we have one, I think on at least on Thursday and Friday, we have also exercise sessions. So there's one quiz question that is related to constructing new features. So assume we have a, we have a data point uh, with a single feature, like uh, one, one day, uh, so one data point represents one day. And then we can construct out, out of nothing in some sense, uh, new features. So we can construct new features by just thresholding the, the original feature value. So we can say we, we create a new feature Z1, which is equal to one if and only if X is between zero and one. Then we create another feature Z2, which is one and only one if X is between one and two and so on and so forth. We create up to, we create here 10 new features and then we, we replace the original feature with a new feature vector C, which contains the six features, uh, 10 features C1 till C10. So you can compute new features. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, a feature is any property that can be measured by a sensor or some hardware or that can be computed easily. And uh, you might be able to compute this, this thresholding, this quantizations easily. So if you can compute these quantizations easily, and this might be only an if else clause in some programming language, then you can use this uh, Z, this C1 till C10 as new features. So why, why would you do this? Why would you compute new features? Any guesses? For grouping? Uh, to create the hypothesis, yes. So this points into an interesting direction. Uh, we can, we can uh, create more complicated uh, hypotheses. So we can stick to just linear maps, but then we use a linear map we use a linear map of this new feature vector. And let's see what can happen with that. Yeah, so we then apply a linear map. So this here, this, uh, this uh, graph structure or this structure here, this graphical structure here, the summation represents a linear model. So we just multiply each feature, C1, C2 and C3 by some weight and we add it up. And combining or applying this linear map to these new features results in a nonlinear map from the original feature to the output, so to the predicted label H of X. So we can use these new features to make a nonlinear map just by using a, a linear map on the new features. So uh, using uh, Creating new features, creating new features allows to make uh, more complicated maps, starting from some base class of maps. So we start from only linear predictors, but we can make an arbitrary nonlinear predictor by combining a linear predictor with uh, with some uh, feature map. For example, this feature map computes these ten new features. Does anybody of you know? Uh, machine learning methods, a large class of machine learning methods, which is based on, on this principle, but which computes a much, much larger number of new features, uh, in particular, an infinite number of new features. There is a large class of machine learning models, which, which is based on this 
uh, combining linear, a linear map, but with new features, which with many, many new features. Yeah, a deep learning. So one comment was deep learning. Uh, deep learning uses um, also, but but in deep learning we combine linear maps and then nonlinear functions. So in 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 deep learning we we concatenate together uh, a lot of linear maps and nonlinear maps, uh, kind of alternatively. But there is one class of machine learning methods which uses a, a strict separation into a nonlinear feature map and then only linear operations. So these are called kernel methods. So maybe some of you have heard about kernel methods and these kernel methods, they are powerful methods which only use linear classifiers and linear predictors, linear maps, but in very high dimensional feature spaces. So kernel methods are, are based on, on first mapping or transforming uh, the features of a data point to a, a large set of new features. And then on these new features, we only use linear maps. And these are called kernel methods. I discussed this in chapter three, in some section of chapter three in my lecture notes. And there's then also a course on, on kernel methods in, in later at, in a master program. Okay. Uh, it might be useful to yeah, there's one what good comment. It might be useful to package uh, useful information in simpler containers. For example, if the phenomenon observed changes from one to another and some variable can indicate which feature is the most contributing one. Yeah, so with, with these new features, uh, yeah, the, only the sky is the limit. You can, you can, in this constructing of new features, you can, for example, uh, use an indicator that tells you this data point belongs to uh, a specific group of data points. For example, this data point might be a day in summer, or this indicator tells you this might be a day in winter. And then for each of these two groups, you might use different linear models. Yes, so this is a powerful idea to, to start with a simple uh, hypothesis space, uh, for example, the set of linear maps, and then make it more powerful by changing the features, by applying a feature map or feature transformation in the beginning. In particular, the large class and very successful class of kernel methods is based on this. Kernel methods have, have kind of a bit lost uh, the popularity compared to deep learning methods, but still they are very important uh, tools for machine learning. Okay. So uh, today I want, since we now have discussed each of the three components separately, I want to now today to talk a bit about the, the combination of the three components of data, model, and loss. So again, I will look at my, my favorite example, uh, and which is now very timely again. Last year, I couldn't show this example because it was such a crappy winter, but this winter is really a good winter, a good Finnish winter. So we have nice ski days and in the morning you look out the window so you know the morning temperature minus 10 and you want to know the maximum daytime temperature. Because you want to avoid a situation like I had last Saturday when I predicted the maximum temperature too high. So it was quite cold then, but I'm good in the meanwhile. So how can we do this? Well, in machine learning we use data. So the first component are data points. And we look at uh, a bunch of, of these data points. Each data point is one whole day. So, and we never, we can never fully characterize one day because we would need all the states of all atoms in the universe to characterize one day. So we, we use only a subset of properties to characterize a data point. One such uh, property is called a feature. In our case, we use the minimum daytime temperature as the feature because this is what we can measure easily in the morning of a new skiing day. And then there's a quantity of interest, which is the maximum daytime temperature. And what machine learning is about, learning a, a map, a hypothesis that takes the feature as input and provides us a good guess for the maximum temperature. 
So uh, in this course, a hypothesis is nothing but a map or a function, a mathematical function that reads in the feature value of the data point like minus 10 and outputs a prediction that hopefully is a good prediction for the maximum daytime temperature. Uh, yes, so I might now try out uh, my, my iPad to change to some handwriting. So bear with me a moment. And now to change it. So can you see my iPad screen? Yes, okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, if, if, you, uh, if you are here, please uh, let me know on the chat. I cannot spot you. So, okay. So we have data. In this case, the data points are representing days, which are characterized by the minimum daytime temperature. So this is the X coordinate. So we have four days. And then we have the maximum daytime temperature, which is the quantity of interest. So what machine learning is about, we want to learn a, a hypothesis. So this function here is called a hypothesis, age of X. And this age of X does nothing but for some, let's say a, a new day is coming. We are in the beginning of a new day and the feature is X is 20. And then what, the, what this hypothesis can do or what I can do with this hypothesis, well, I can evaluate it. I can say, okay, so here I predict the maximum daytime temperature by age of 20. So I just evaluate or I compute the prediction. And this already just computing Computing this prediction might be challenging. This is called, so computing to compute the function value at the, so the, the hypothesis for the particular value, feature value 20 is called inference. And this is easy for a linear function, but this is challenging for a deep neural network where this, uh, this hypothesis involves like a million parameters or weights, let's call them weights. So this is a, a very complicated function in general. So even computing this inference is, is costly or takes some computation. However, machine learning is even, inter we are interested in an even more difficult problem. We want to find, we want to learn a good hypothesis, learn a good hypothesis. because we have several of these hypotheses. Machine learning is always based on more than one hypothesis. So we have a whole space of hypotheses or hypothesis space. Let's say for, for the sake of illustration, we use a hypothesis space, which is given by all functions of the form X plus some weight W. So this is the weight. We also call it sometimes a parameter, which we want to tune, which we learn. So this here is, is kind of a tuning knob. And so we get different, a different a hypothesis for different choices of the weight. So how, how do we choose and the set of all these functions? So if we if if we vary this W over all real numbers, we get a whole set or space of, of functions or hypotheses. And this is called a hypothesis space. So a hypothesis space is a set of functions. And in this course, I like to use the term model, model for hypothesis space, because for some reason, students don't like the, the term hypothesis space. I, I assume the problem is the, the word space. So then, People might think about Hilbert space, algebraic spaces, and uh, it might be scary. So uh, let's use the word model. But in the end, it's just a set of, of different hypotheses 
And machine learning, the, the quintessential of machine learning is to choose the best, in some sense, best hypothesis within a whole set of hypotheses. So how, how can we find the best hypothesis? Well, we need to, to make clear what we mean by best. So we need a loss function. And one loss function I've shown here is the, the uh, squared error loss. So this here, the, yeah. So one, one student now made a comment. Now I understand hypothesis space better. Thank you for the explanation. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable in the student feedback of my courses the last four years, the hypothesis space is the most difficult concept to grasp for students, it seems. But in the end, it's just a set of different, of different functions. Uh, yeah, so how can we choose a good one? So here's one, here's one specific, here's one specific such linear hypothesis in blue. This is one specific. There might be another one. Let's draw another one in green with a different value of W. And the question is, which one is better? So in order to say which one is better, we need to measure somehow the quality of a hypothesis. And how do we do it? Well, we measure the quality of a hypothesis using the average loss. So we compare, we compare the values of the labels of data points. So for this data point, we know the label. So we know, for example, here the maximum daytime temperature was, uh, let's say, five. But for this data point, we also know the feature, of course, because the feature we always know. Uh, let's say it was zero. So here the feature was zero of the third data point. And the, the predictor here, age of x would mean, so this here, this here is the, the prediction for the label of the third data point. This is age of uh, x3. And it's, which is age of zero because the feature of the third data point is zero, the feature value. And this y hat is different from y. So the predicted label here is different from the true label. So there's a prediction error. And in the square, squared error loss, we just take the square of this difference uh, as a quality measure. And we, we don't, we cannot, we can compute this uh, prediction error not only for the third data point, but for all data points in our data set. So we have here a set of one, two, three, four data points for which we know, for which we know the maximum daytime temperature. And so we can compute the, we can compute the average loss. So let's denote this E of W, which is one over four. And then we sum from the first data point to the last, which is four, uh, the label of the i data point minus the predicted label of the i data point squared. So this here is the prediction error. And this here is the squared error loss of, on the i data point. So there's one question. The model is set by convenience, for example, of uh, instead of uh, the model that I use, we could choose. Yeah, exactly. So this, this hypothesis space is just my first guess for a good hypothesis space. Instead, we could use also a, another hypothesis space. Oh my God. No, I mixed up the, I need to get used to this blackboard art again. It's a while since I did this. So another hypothesis space would be h of x is uh, a function of uh, first weight times feature plus another weight. So this is another hypothesis space. And this hypothesis space is, is, larger, uh, is larger than this hypothesis space. Uh, but I, I say, okay, simple, simple might be good. Let's, let's start with this hypothesis space here. So let's start with the simple one. And we will see then in round, round four, we will learn methods that allow to tell if this was a good choice or if we should use another hypothesis space. 
Yes, uh, so again, very good comment from a student. I, so I figure out the best space is by trial and error. Yes, whole, all machine learning is trial and error. So uh, if you look at the figure one uh, of my lecture notes, this is this principle of trial and error. And it's implemented all over in, in, uh, in machine learning, just on different levels and using different different uh, concepts to measure errors or to measure uh, or to collect data. Uh, there are so many different design choices involved, but the principle is always trial and error, always. So there's one question, why, why, is the, why uh, was this green hypothesis space bigger? Well, uh, you can show, um, yeah, maybe I make a quiz question out of it. Thank you for the question. Uh, another comment, are there practical methods to make machine learning algorithms restrict the space themselves based on reward and loss? Yes, so uh, as, I, as I already uh, mentioned, so in round four, we learn methods that, that uh, re restrict the kind of choose between different hypothesis spaces based on, on, on a notion of, of, of loss. So this loss is then called validation error. Yes, so there are methods, but for now, let's say we, we stick to this. So, uh, okay, another question in how much detail we will cover the various training algorithms. So uh, we will not focus uh, training itself. So, so let, me, let me now continue and, and answer this question while I go. So uh, now we have defined the, the average loss and we want to make the average loss as small as possible. So this is then called empirical risk minimization. So we choose, choose W by minimizing, minimizing this average loss. Now this sounds, sounds reasonable. And this average loss is also called training error. So it's the error we obtain by comparing or, or hypothesis against this labeled data set, which is called training error. So most machine learning methods, if not all machine learning methods are optimization methods. And you can solve this optimization method with pen and paper. So this is done by in, in, the, in the course book or in the lecture notes in the end of chapter two, I demonstrate how to do this. Would anyone have an idea how, how to solve this minimization problem in this specific case? So if we insert this expression, this, uh, formula here for the error, we would get, we have to minimize one over four and then the sum of squares, y i minus y hat i, uh, but y hat i, so then we insert the definition of our hypothesis, which is, uh, so here we insert then uh, our formula, which is x i plus the weight squared. So we end up with an optimization problem in the variable W. So how to choose W, this number W, to minimize this quantity. How, would anybody know how to do this? Yes, set derivative to zero, exactly. That's one very powerful method. So we would just set the derivative or in, in Let's yeah. Let's stick to the the scalar case. This can be extended easily to several weights. Then we have the gradient, but here we have the derivative. So the derivative of this function we set to zero. And this, when we set this to zero, so this is not an equality. This is set to. We we want this. We desire this equality to hold, and we get then a formula for w for the optimal weight that you can work out on your own or, but then now to this question uh, of the student, uh, which asked how, in how much detail we will cover the various training algorithms. So these training algorithms are essentially optimization methods. So how, how to solve such optimization methods. And there are entire fields in, in applied mathematics on how to, how to develop optimization methods. We will not study this in any depth in this course. So one, one of the main methods to solve such problems is called gradient descent. 
and I have devoted a, a whole chapter in my course book on this. I guess it's chapter five, if I'm not wrong, chapter five of ML book CS Auto FI. But in this course, we will not, uh, so at least in my part, I will not go in any detail in this. Uh, you, will, you will have to use or look around for software that can uh, solve such problems, solve such minimization problems. Does anyone remember what, what tool I used to solve such a minimization problem in the last week's lecture? I solved such an optimization in Excel, yes. So in a, in a, in a spreadsheet program, maybe you need an add-in, uh, a solver add-in, but you can use a, a spreadsheet program for this or whatever you want. So IBM SPSS is also an option and we have some support for how you to use IBM SPSS uh, by, by RTA. So they have prepared demo videos to show you how to solve such training problems uh, in SPSS and feel free to ask in the exercise sessions. Yeah, by the way, you, you get a free uh, a version or a, a student license via Alto Campus software for IBM SPSS, uh, which is nice to try out if you want. And of course, in Python, if you want, then there are this, this one liner Python codes like linear regression dot fit, which solves this minimization problem. And the nice thing is about such a dot fit function, you also have it for some deep neural network dot, dot fit. So whenever you see such a dot fit function in, in a Python code, this means that you solve uh, such a minimization problem, a training problem. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, also MATLAB. MATLAB, you have such solvers uh, in MATLAB, you can do it, or uh, you can implement a gradient descent by yourself. This is, uh, I would say, uh, almost like a bread and butter tool. Uh, so this is called gradient descent, but I do not require you to understand the details of gradient descent in this course. So another question is, backpropagation, one of the topics we are going to cover? No, because backpropagation, at least in my part, I will not cover backpropagation because backpropagation uh, is just a, a specific way to compute the gradients of, so to compute uh, uh, the, if we have more than one, fee, uh, one weight, so we have, let's say we have uh, a weight vector, W1 up to Wn, like in, in deep neural networks, you, you not only have one weight like here, one single weight, but you have uh, billions of weights. So you don't, then you don't have the derivative, but you have to compute the gradient. And backpropagation is an efficient way uh, to compute these gradients, computed by backpropagation. And it's also propagation. I mean, there's not mathematics behind backpropagation. It's just a clever way to compute the gradient. Uh, uh, for uh, a specific hypothesis, which is represented by an artificial neural network. Uh, I, I quickly go over, to I think um, uh, uh, Professor Sick, who is teaching now the next round, starting next week, will uh, discuss artificial neural networks there. Okay. So another question, can we use other programming language for machine learning like Java or C++? Yes, you can use whatever you want. You can use programming languages, but we don't require you to use any specific programming language. You can also use a, a Microsoft Excel solver to find an optimal linear predictor as I have demonstrated last week. So there's one question, where can I find the instructions for the peer review? Yeah, you should find those in the, when you hit the, the activity button in, in my courses. Uh, but I will, I will uh, instruct the TAs to help you with this, uh, to give you more details on the instructions if needed. Okay, I suggest now after this start, we have a 10 minutes break and continue at or slightly less than 10 minutes, we continue at 10 past three. And in the meanwhile, I, I take questions. <clears throat> so there's one question, does the minimization of this error E of W only give you 
uh, only the term that puts the linear model on the right place on the y-axis. How about the slope? Yes, so it's in this case, in this case, we only use one, one weight, which is the, so this is the offset. Uh, so here choosing W means we move the, the straight line up or down, but we do not change the slope. So the slope is fixed to, to one. So we could use also here another weight. So this was one suggestion. We could use another weight, uh, W1. And then we could also change the slope. So then we would also have control over the slope and the, the offset, so the vertical position of the, of the curve. Um, there's another question. Why is Python good for machine learning? Uh, uh, so my first uh, reply would be it's completely free. It's open. So you don't have to bother buying a license. It's completely free. Uh, and there are many, many people uh, using Python and you will find many projects. So if you, if in your, in your student project, you want to develop, uh, you want to develop a method that tells you of what, if, if an image shows a, a Nokia smartphone or not, then you can Google image classification and you find many, many toy projects where, where other uh, developers have already tried out different uh, machine learning methods and you can take it from there. So they typically open source it um, on some GitHub repository and you can adapt and, and, and start from their project. So you don't have to start from scratch. So there's just uh, such a large community already using Python and so many uh, examples already available that you can uh, use to start in your project. So it somehow developed and at some point it was just uh, the de facto standard programming language for machine learning, but it might change. So who knows? <clears throat> yeah, I just uh, answered this question. Why do people prefer Python machine learning as the large amount of libraries support and community. Uh, so it, it might be a good idea to start learning Python if you want to learn uh, or refresh your programming skills. So that's, that's a very difficult question. Uh, which tools should I train myself in to be a professional in machine learning? Uh, uh, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, as I said already before, machine learning is applied mathematics and statistics. The more you know about mathematics and in particular applied mathematics like uh, numerical linear algebra, probability theory, the more tools you have available for doing good machine learning. But machine learning also involves collecting data. So how you transmit data, how to efficiently store data. So computer science skills, uh, machine learning often also involves customers so you should also be able to, to deal with customers. Um, so social skills are important. So the machine learning, machine, uh, machine learning people are the kind of uh, MacGyvers of, of the age of big data. So you should have pretty good grip on, on almost everything you learn in engineering and uh, science classes. Huh. There's a question, why is there a seemingly arbitrary one hour limit for the quiz. According to my observations, each separate trial has an independent timer starting from zero. So you can do the quiz once, write down the questions and use unlimited time work there to work them out before starting the other attempt. Yes, uh, so we are still uh, exploring how well this works. So we want to avoid too much free riding and, but as I pointed out, we will do random checks. So we will randomly select submissions in any of the course assignments and ask students to explain their submissions. So what, whatever you submit, you should be uh, familiar with. Uh, yeah, I don't know, we, we might change this, this setup and uh, maybe change the number of attempts and also change the, the, the timing of the quizzes. So this will depend on the feedback. Again, we, we also do trial and error in developing the course. So make good use of the of the course feedback in the end, then to tell us what you would like to what you didn't like so much.
Yeah, there are more questions coming in. When, when is the start of the next quiz after round one quiz? Yes, so the round two will start uh, next week on Monday and most likely we will then release quiz for round two. So round two and round three will be lectured by my colleague, Professor Sick, Stefan Sick. And I will then again continue with round four. So another question. So I have shown here another, another hypothesis space, uh, which consists of all maps of the form W1 times X plus some W0. And the question is, uh, why is this hypothesis space bigger than that hypothesis space? And you can show this since any map of this form is also a map of this form with the particular choice W1 equal to one. But you can also have other maps by choosing W1, for example, equal to two, which are not in this space here. So you can show that any element of this space must belong to this space. And that's how you show that this space is larger than this hypothesis space. Okay, so let's collect some more questions. <clears throat> so there's one question, what is the computational complexity of fitting a machine learning model? Uh, so the complexity of this optimization problem depends on several factors. It depends on how many weights you have. If you have only one weight, then it might be easier than you have billions of weights. So how large is the dimension of the optimization problem? It also depends on how many data points do you have in this, uh, in this training set. So are these billions of data points or four data points? Uh, then also the difficulty depends on what you use as loss function. So this squared error loss is only one choice and this uh, makes the optimization problem easier, but uh, you, you could also use another loss function, which is the absolute error loss, which is non-differentiable and which makes it more, more computationally more complex. So the computational complexity of this fitting problem or learning problem or empirical risk minimization depends on several factors, including the particular shape of the loss function. Yeah. Uh, so let me now continue with discussing uh, a subclass of machine learning problems <clears throat> that are called classification problems. Classification. So in classification problems, we have a data point again with features which are some numeric quantities, a feature vector. So we have X1 up to Xn different features. And we have a label, a quantity of interest, but now the label is not a number like the maximum daytime temperature, but it's just indicating one out of two possible states. So the label could be either one or minus one or the label could be, uh, we just need two different symbols. The label could be triangle or circle. So it's either, uh, so it's one value out of a set of two different values. We call this a binary classification problem. So can, can you see my, my uh, iPad here? Yes. So. Yeah, some people can see my, my hand drawing. So uh, there's one question, uh, labels are always binary. No, it, it's just how, how I choose it. Remember, you can choose what the label values are. So I now say, I, I now define the label of a data point. So let's say a data point represents, represents some winter day again, represents some winter day. And the label 
could be, let's say, plus one if the maximum temperature is larger than 10. Or I said the label is minus one if the maximum daytime temperature is smaller or equal than 10. Okay, so I can define, I can, I can say if the maximum daytime temperature is larger than 10 degrees, then I set the label is equal to plus one, uh, where, whereas if the maximum daytime temperature is smaller or equal than 10 degrees, then I set the label to minus one. I can define it. Remember, the label is a design choice. And I now want to learn a predictor that allows me to, to take, so let's, uh, for simplicity, assume we have one single feature which is again, the minimum daytime temperature. Minimum daytime temperature. Uh, so we want to learn uh, a classifier that reads in the feature and outputs a guess or a prediction for the label. So is the label either plus one? So do we think the maximum daytime temperature will be larger than 10 or not? In which case it should output minus one. So that's a binary classification problem. In the end, it's again about learning a map or a hypothesis that maps the feature X is the feature to a predicted label, Y hat. And we hope we want to learn a hypothesis such that Y hat, the predicted label, is equal to the true label as often or as much as possible. And then I want to show you a, a trick, or let's call it a trick, that turns this classification problem into a problem of predicting a number. So let's say instead of predicting the label directly, so plus one or minus one, we want to predict the number, predict the, or, or we say, let's use, a, let's use again a linear hypothesis. So let's say W1 times X plus W0. And then you might say, uh, but uh, we want to predict a, a binary value plus one or minus one, but this here is, uh, is any real number. So how, how, how does this make sense? We should, we should somehow uh, quantize or threshold this output. And we can do this. I mean, we could say for a given linear hypothesis, we obtain the, the predicted label equal a plus one if this hypothesis is larger or equal than zero, or we classify a data point as minus one if this linear hypothesis is smaller than zero. So what, what's the point? Why do we use this uh, linear hypothesis and not directly look for a map that uh, takes the uh, feature as input? So this X as input and outputs either plus one or minus one. Well, it turns out to be very useful because we can interpret, we can interpret the magnitude or the absolute value of this predictor as the confidence. confidence in y hat. So y hat, the classification itself, we obtain just by thresholding the value of the hypothesis. So if it's larger or equal than zero, we say y hat. So we predict the, the, the label as plus one. If, it, if the hypothesis is smaller than zero, we predict the label as minus one. But moreover, we also can say something about the confidence so if, the, if this value is much, much larger than zero, 
then we, we could say we are much more confident in, in the label being plus one. Whereas if, if this uh, absolute value is close to zero, then we could say we are not so confident about this y hat. So we use this linear map, we still use a linear hypothesis like we did in regression, but we now interpret it as a confidence in, in, the, in the prediction. There's a very good comment. Um, does this turn your ski example for predicting the highest temperature to a classification problem uh, where the label is some set of available ski waxes? Yes, very good point. So this, this classification problem, so plus one could mean use wax A or wax A is the best, whereas minus one could mean use ski wax B or wax B is the best for this day. Yes. So we, we turn this predicting of a maximum daytime temperature into a classification problem. And we can do this because in the end, labels are just uh, a design choice. So what are you interested in there? Okay, so let me now show you how we could, how we could guess a good loss function. So what, what are the three main components of machine learning? Data model and loss, very good. So this is something I want to burn into your brains in this course. This is my brainwashing program. Three components of machine learning, whenever, wherever you ask, I ask you this, I want to hear data model and loss. Uh, what, what do you see here on, on, my, on my page? Which components I have now discussed so far? Do we have data? Did we discuss what data points are? Their features and labels? Yes, so we I have discussed here what, what means a data uh, what is a data point is some winter day. I have discussed the feature minimum daytime temperature. I have discussed the, the label plus one if the maximum temperature is larger than 10 minus one if it's smaller or equal than 10. I also have discussed the particular hypothesis because I have said we use a linear hypothesis. So what is missing? That we complete a machine learning problem or that we have a complete machine learning problem, the loss. So which loss, which loss function do I have to use? Is there anything that guides us in this choice? Is there any mathematical rule or mathematical theory that allows us to derive the best loss function here? Hmm. Square the difference, absolute error. Okay, let's try it. So I now, plot here the loss function as a function of the output of the hypothesis, okay? So this is not, this is not a scatter plot. So we do not use the, the vertical axis. We do not uh, use the vertical axis to represent label values, but we use it now to represent different loss functions, okay? So don't confuse it with a scatter plot. <clears throat> we just use this now to, to try out or to look at different loss functions and see how it works. So, and to evaluate the loss function, so to remember a loss function is something that takes a data point with feature X and label Y and some hypothesis. So this here is the hypothesis and assigns some number, which we call loss. So we need, we need to have a data point for which we know the true label. So let's say we have some data point with uh, minimum daytime temperature X is minus five, uh, but the maximum daytime temperature was plus 15. So what is the label for this data point? So the maximum daytime temperature was plus 15. What is the label? No, it's not plus 15. The label is plus one, yes because we defined it like this. Plus 15 is larger than 10. So the label, this is the Y is plus one. 
Okay, and now we, we try out, uh, we try out uh, different hypotheses or different values of the hypothesis. So let's say here the value is zero. So remember with threshold at zero. So here on this side, we would make the prediction y hat is plus one. And here we are very confident. So for very large positive values, we are very confident. Whereas close to zero, we are little, we have only little confidence in our classification that y hat should be one for this data point. And here on the other hand, it's, it's symmetric. So here we are very confident, very confident if it goes towards minus infinity, we are very confident that y hat should be minus one. Please ask questions here. So this is now very important for, for large parts of the course. Ask any questions. So here we have, the more we get to the left, the more confident or very confident we are in y hat equal minus one because we threshold it at zero. And if, if, if h of x is smaller than zero, we see y hat is minus one. But if it's very close to zero, we have only little, so close to zero, we have little confidence. So we are, uh, when I say confidence, I mean, how confident are we in outputting, uh, in, in using y hat equal one? So how confident are we in this prediction? When, when, you, when you are at the bus stop and you look at the, at the board for, the, for the, the time to arrival, these are only predictions. These are only predictions. And typically we like to have with these predictions also some measure of, of confidence. So we use, we use the sign of this predict, predictor map, h of x, for getting the, the, the classification. So if it's larger than zero, we see y hat is one. And additionally, we use the absolute value. So how far on the right it is as a measure for the confidence that actually y hat, so that this y hat equal one is a correct prediction. So it's the confidence in this prediction being correct, so to say. <clears throat> so why I use the x axis, it's just convenience. So you can also turn it around. So you can use the x axis for the loss. And so this is just convenience. So then another question here, how do we quantify or express confidence? Well, I just define, I just define to use the, the absolute value of h of x as the confidence. It's just the definition. I just define it. And let me show you, or you will see then later on in the course that it's a, it makes sense, this definition. You can, my, my math teacher, when I did uh, my uh, university studies always said, you can define what you want. It just should make sense. And you will see it will make sense to define the confidence as the absolute value of the linear predictor. Okay, so let's now try to guess. Let's now try to develop an intuition for how a good loss function should look like. So there was one, there was one suggestion to use as loss function, the squared error. So the squared error would look like, so here y, the squared error would look like as follows. y is equal to plus one. So the squared error would be zero here when h of x equals one. <clears throat> so this would be y minus h of x squared. So this is the squared loss. Do you like this loss function? So large loss means that we, we punish, we punish a hypothesis. So in particular, uh, the squared error loss function would punish a hypothesis which is which yields values very much on the right. So this would punish a, a hypothesis, which is very confident in the predicted label being equal to one. And this, by the way, is, is a correct, is correct prediction, would be a correct. So here is, is correct. These are correct predictions. Here's a wrong prediction. So the squared error loss would mean that a hypothesis, h of x, 
which is very much on the right here, so it's very correct and very confident in the correct decision, would have a high loss. Is this what we want? <clears throat> no, this is not what we want. So, and this shows you that a squared error loss is not good, is not a good choice for, uh, for learning a hypothesis, for in this case, learning a linear hypothesis for a binary classification problem. What would we like to have? We would like to have a loss function, which as it goes to the right, the loss should be smaller and smaller because the more right we are, our hypothesis that is very much on the right here is delivers a correct prediction. So it delivers y hat equal to one, which is correct since the true label is also one. And it's also very confident in the, in the, in the correct prediction. So we would like to have uh, a loss function that does not penalize, that has very small values here towards the right. Okay. On the other hand, this loss function should penalize, should be very large if a predictor is very confident in y hat equals minus one, which means wrong prediction because the true label is plus one. True label is plus one, but it would be very confident in y hat minus one. So this is exactly what we do not want. So we want to explode to go up here on the left. So this is a, a prototype for a, a loss for a classification problem. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then there are several examples for this. So I, I discuss in the course book in, uh, sec in chapter three, you will hear about the, the logistic loss, which almost looks like this. So the logistic loss is such a function. Then another option is the, the hinge loss. The hinge loss looks like this. Also very large here, but then it goes to zero and stays at zero. So this is the hinge loss. Another example, does anybody know another example for a loss function that would fit this, this or would, would behave in this manner that we would like to have for a binary classification problem? So we have the hinge loss, we have the logistic loss. Does anybody know another loss function that could be used for a classification problem? Uh, what would be the formula? What would be the formula? Oh yes, that's a good question. The logistic loss, where do I, for, for the green curve? Oh no, for, for the green curve, this is, just, this is just my brainstorming curve. This green curve I just made up. Uh, the logistic loss you find in the course book. And if I'm not wrong, it's the formula is one over one mm, plus E minus H of X. Or is it plus one? Should be smaller. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I must admit, I think it's log one plus e minus h of x logistic loss you find it in the book i don't ask you to be able to derive it you can derive it from a probabilistic model but i will not discuss this now uh there's one comment but isn't that make the left confidence punished yes uh, so uh, a classification loss classification loss should be large here it, it should it should punish this confidence because this confidence is the worst case because you are very confident but you are very confident in a wrong classification we, we would rather prefer if we do a wrong classification so if we say y hat is minus one but in in reality it's plus one then we would say we would like the predictor at least to be not so confident so because if, if the predictor tells us that it has only little confidence, then we might not rely too much on it. But if it says it's very confident that y hat is minus one, then we might rely on it and this is then bad. So we, we want to punish this confidence, this bad confidence because it's confidence in, in the wrong choice. Okay, 
uh, yeah, one good comment, the step loss, exactly. Uh, the step loss is also an option. I call it, uh, I like to call it the zero one loss. So I'm now, huh, now hitting the limit with the colors. So a zero one loss, this one here, bam. So it's one, it's one for uh, wrong, wrong classification or wrong output. And it's zero for the correct output. So this is called the zero one loss. So which loss function do you like most? Logistic loss, yeah, logistic loss is a good choice. I also like logistic loss. Why do you like logistic loss most? <clears throat> it can be minimized, yeah, uh, all functions can be minimized. If you know a function, you can look for the minimum of it. Yes, but very good comment, it's differentiable. So it's smooth. So we can, we can find the minimum by by a method called gradient descent, which means you go down, you hop to small hops, always downhill. And if the hops are not uh, too large, you will end up at the minimum. Uh, the, the hinge loss is not differentiable, by the way. So the hinge loss has here a corner, has an edge. At this point, the hinge loss is not differentiable. So you cannot use gradient descent, but still it's not too difficult because it's still convex. So a convex function is still uh, good to optimize. Uh, so the, the worst computational wise is the zero one loss because the zero one loss is neither smooth nor uh, differentiable. So here we have the zero one loss has here a, a, a discontinuous uh, point here at zero. And uh, you will hear about uh, methods that can minimize the zero one loss, which are not based on gradient descent because uh, it's non-differentiable. There's one very good comment. Uh, how did you know that uh, the hypothesis H of X is more correct on the right? Uh, well, this is by, so why, why did I know that? Uh, very good question. How did I know that here on, on the right side, we are happy? Uh, uh, because because by, by construction, because we defined that the, the, the predicted label is plus one if the, the hypothesis is larger than zero and the true label here is plus one. So in order that the predicted label is the true label, it must be plus one and plus one it is only by definition of our, of our classifier on the right. So it's, it's to, some, to some extent, it's just uh, uh, my choice. Uh, you could also, when, when you define the classifier different, so you could also say you predict plus one if the classifier is smaller than zero, you can do that. And the effect would just that you, you mirror this image here. But still the squared error loss would also not work in this case because the squared error loss goes up on both sides. That's the problem of the squared error loss for classification. It goes up to infinity on both sides and one side must be the correct side. Uh, yes, so one comment, uh, one question when the, the predicted, when the output of the, of, the, of the hypothesis is minus one, then it's classified as y hat is equal to minus one. Yes, so it would be wrong then would be a wrong classification because the, the true label by our choice of the data point is plus one. <clears throat> so there's one comment. I thought that as we go further and further left on the x-axis, we also go to the region where the label is more likely to be minus one, as in we can say with high confidence that it's minus one. I don't understand now why we think that is punishable. So this confidence, this confidence here refers to, so it's very confident in the classification it, it produces. So it's confident in the output it delivers, but in reality, the true label is plus one. So it's, it's very confident in, a wrong, in its wrong output. And this is what we want to punish. 
you should not be if you don't know something then you should make it clear and a, a hypothesis makes it clear if the if the absolute value is near zero but you should not be very confident in in something wrong so in here if the if the output would be very negative like minus 10 to the power of six then we would be very confident that y hat in in, in our classification y hat equal to one and this classification is wrong so we would be very confident in a wrong classification and this is what we want to punish by all means okay so there's another comment in this example the left side is assumed to be wrong because the thresholds are larger or equal than zero and smaller than zero yes so uh the, the left side here this is the bad side this is the bad side because uh we define the classifier as we do so we say y hat is minus one if the predictor if the output of the hypothesis is smaller than zero yes it's by our construction we would need to flip or mirror the, this loss figure here if we use a different definition um, so another comment so basically this example concerns only this particular data point yes so it's only one data point uh, one data point is already a data set so whatever, whenever we have found that the loss function is bad for one data point, we should not use it for any machine learning problem because you can, you could happen to have only one data point. But also this, this general problem uh, remains also if you have several data points and you average, you average the individual loss functions. <clears throat> so another comment. So basically this example comes, yeah, this one data point, yes. Uh, another comment and what, is punishing what does punish mean here does this mean discarding yes so punish means that we want a loss function we want a loss function that uh, doesn't that favors uh, predictor maps that that deliver predictions here on the right side so to punish mean it should have a high uh, any any predictor map that gives a very confident wrong classification here should have a high loss function because what we then do in machine learning is we, we look for the hypothesis with the smallest possible loss function and so if we give it a, if we get the if we give the bad hypothesis a high loss function then we will not learn it in the end so let's see what we have other loss function uh, another comment so we should have different loss functions for each classification no uh, no, so we can use the same loss function also for for so if the if the loss function works for this example where the true label is plus one, it will also work by by symmetry for for another data point if the if the true label would be minus one. So you just flip the curves then, but you always the correct the correct classifications uh, are then always uh, having a smaller loss function. So this works also for other data points. We can use the same loss function for uh, data points with plus one, true label plus one or minus one. <clears throat> Very good question. What would be, how would the loss function, so how would this plot look like if the true label would be minus one? Uh, I, will, I will make this a quiz question. Very good question. Uh, so, if we another comment if we can have a hypothesis that is perfectly accurate would it diverge to infinite confidence with logistic loss um, yes so uh, it would uh, I, I don't know what exactly is meant here with converge to infinite loss uh, the, the more negative uh, the predictor is or the hypothesis so if it's uh, minus 10 to the power of six the more uh, the larger will be the loss function and if if it's even some more negative then the loss function is even larger but in, in reality you get some value so if if you plug in some value for x and you have a mapping uh that must give you some value some finite value uh Another comment in, in a practical scenario, we can we apply more than one loss functions to decide correct uh, uh, 
to to choose the best hypothesis. Yes, so you can you can mix different loss functions. You could, for example, uh, use for for this uh, objective function here uh, a mix of a logistic loss and and hinge loss. You can do this, yeah. But this would then be in the end just a, a more fancy loss function that you build by summing two more basic loss functions. In the end, the loss function is a design choice. <clears throat> Another comment, wouldn't it be easier to use um, H of X times Y so that the correct prediction is always, so? yes, that's a very good comment. Yeah, so uh, this student here knows how the, the the loss function would look like for for true label being minus one. So we could, uh, instead of of plotting here h of x, so the predictor value, we could plot the product uh, h of x times y, and then this all that is on this figure here applies for any data point. So it would hold also for uh, true label being minus one because with this multiplication, you implicitly kind of uh, mirror this uh, figure whenever necessary. So if we use uh, true label being minus one, then multiplying with y here means that we flip the x-axis, but the figure itself stays the same. And also the, the, the correct prediction, the correct prediction stays on the right side and the wrong prediction stays on the left side. So that's a very good hint by, by one of the students. So instead of using the x-axis for depicting the, the hypothesis value, depict the hypothesis value times the label. But this trick only works if the label is uh, minus one or one. <clears throat> yes, I agree. So this COVID is, is very good COVID. Um, what does phi mean here? I don't know where I put a phi. There is no phi. Ah, this here is zero. This here is zero. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for my, that's just a zero. Yes. It's not the phi, the Greek phi. Yeah. Um, I apologize. Apologies for my handwriting. I try to be more tidy in the next lectures. Okay, so that's pretty much about it, what I wanted to talk about today. So I now discussed again, how to combine the three components, data, model, and loss function. And uh, in particular for classification problems, you should not use the squared error loss. So there are other loss functions like the hinge loss, the logistic loss, or the zero one loss, which are more suitable for the reasons now discussed or which I have tried to explain. You can read more about this in chapter three of my lecture notes. And again, when there are any questions on the course material or assignments, do not hesitate to reach out by email to course staff or on the Sulip discussion forum or uh, by asking questions in the exercise sessions. And the next exercise session starts in a bit less than half and a bit less than 30 minutes at quarter past four. You find the Zoom link in um, at the My Courses page. Okay, thanks a lot and see you soon, bye.